meeting is being recorded. Hey guys, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where here we talk Beatles, almost entirely Beatles here on my channel. And every single show we've got a special guest or more. This time we have Bernie Hamburger with us. I first met Bernie back in the 90s through a mutual friend of ours in Detroit, Jeff Togel. How you doing, Jeff? And um, Bernie's had a career both as a musician and also in uh, repairing and uh, designing guitars. And in particular, there's one guitar that he gave to George Harrison, which we'll talk about in a few moments uh, in this interview. He also designed an electric mandolin that he gave to George as well. Bernie, welcome to Ken Michaels Radio. Hi, Ken. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time, you know. I've always wanted to get in yeah. contact with you since since uh, the 90s. We did an interview back then, which uh -huh. on reel-to-reel -reel tape, but I don't have a reel-to-reel -reel machine, so I can't play it back. <laughs> so now right. we got this, this wonderful thing called Zoom. And yes, thank you. Yeah. Why don't we just talk about uh, the very beginning of uh, of your career, but but also the your early love of music and... Mm -hmm. And how did you get into the Beatles? And what else did you like growing up as a kid besides the Beatles? Well, okay, I was a little Jewish boy growing up in the Bronx. And um, I grew up a few blocks from Yankee Stadium. So obviously before Beatlemania, Mickey Mantle was my Beatles or my hero at the time. And it was all about the Yankees, okay? And then all of a sudden uh, I heard this great song on the radio. It was, I want to hold your hand. And I go, what the heck is that? You know, and I'm only 12, but it really boggled my mind. And Murray the K, the disc jockey in New York at the time, he played that. She loves you. Please, please me like over and over all day, blah, blah, blah. And then they announced they're going to be on the Ed Sullivan show on Sunday night. Hmm. So like me as part of the other 70 plus million people tuned in, saw that opened up with all my loving and it just paralyzed me. It was like, what is this? Who is this? Wow, this is amazing. Mm. You know, and so I fell in love right away with the Beatles, needless to say. And uh, for some reason, John Lennon and George Harrison, I really gravitated to them because I always kind of had an interest in the guitar as an instrument, but never seriously. Yeah. So what happened was Sunday night was over and I was like in a buzz over what we just experienced. And I asked my father, and he finished his sentence. Yes, I'll buy you a guitar. <laughs> so he bought me a guitar. And of course, uh, also that next day, we went to the store and bought me the Beatles album. And uh, I listened to the album over and over again. And my father says, I'm going to get you lessons. And my, I said, sure, OK. After the third lesson, the teacher calls my father and says, I'm not teaching your son anymore. And my father says, why not? What's wrong with Bernie? He goes, nothing. He's teaching me how to play Beatles songs. <laughs> so I was blessed with an ear, Ken. I, I, I can hear his song and I can pretty much play it, and, which is why on YouTube I have a lot of lessons showing people how George Harrison played the guitar solos in various Beatles songs. Oh, so God. one thing led to another. I fell in love with the guitar as an instrument. Then I started working on them, making my guitar play and perform better. My friends asked me to do the same on theirs. Yada, 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 fast forward. And then I said, well, I'm going to try building a guitar. I have nothing to lose. And that was when I was in my 20s. And it was pretty success successful. The very first guitar I made wound up in the hands of Andy Summers of the police. Wow. Yeah, I was very fortunate. That's some, that's some start right there. <laughs> yes, it is, sir. Um, did you like any other music prior to the Beatles? Uh, prior to the Beatles, I did, I, you know, I mean, just think a minute of early 60s, late 50s. I was a, be a Beach Boy fan. I liked the surf music, the ventures, all that stuff kind of made me want to play guitar. But the Beatles is what really made me pull the trigger. Yeah, I got to have a guitar. Hmm. Um, even though this question can go in a million directions, sure. but I keep it simple. But what was it specifically about the Beatles, their music, their sound? Did you feel this was unlike anything else you'd ever heard before? It was like, what planet are these guys from? Because this is unlike anything else, mind you. Okay, as great as the Beach Boys are and were, 
even they didn't record their own instruments or play their own, the wrecking crew played their instruments in the studio. Um, and other artists, they just stood up with their three piece suit, held a microphone and sang while other musicians. And a lot of those guys didn't write their own songs. They had writers. Well, that's what made the Beatles were the trifecta. They wrote their own stuff. They sang their own stuff, recorded their own stuff and played their own instruments, et cetera. And that's what made them like, wow, these guys, who else does this, you know? Hmm. Interesting. Were you into at all any of the folk music prior to uh, the Beatles? Like, you know, Bob Dylan wrote his music. Yes, I was into Bob Dylan a little bit, yeah. you know, but for some reason, the electric guitar is what really grabbed me. And of course, that's what the Beatles played on the Ed Sullivan show. Um, Dylan played the acoustic guitar. And yeah, he did play electric eventually, which is oddly enough, because I actually did some fret work on Bob Dylan's famous old Stratocaster. But that's another story we get into later. But um, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of the early, late 50s, I was into, um, I loved the way uh, James Burton played on, on all the Elvis recordings. Great guitar player, Scotty Moore. You know, all those, Cliff Gallup, all those guys were great. But they didn't have what the Beatles had. They, they were just something special. They were set aside from everything else. You know, it's interesting as you as you gradually study the Beatles and you learn about all their influences, it it suddenly becomes kind of obvious in some ways, the Everly Brothers and Buddy Holly and yeah. you know, Chuck Berry. But I guess when it hit you first in 1964, like it did, those thoughts never crept into your brain. After that, everything went on a back burner and it was just Beatles, here we go. It was just great. What can I say? Who got, nobody else does that stuff. And even to this day, yeah, there were a lot of other British. It opened the door for a lot of other British invasion bands, Dave Clark Five, Peter and Gordon, Freddie and the Dreamers, Herman Hermits, the Animals, and so on. And they were great, but they just weren't the Beatles. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know, a lot of those bands would have been even bigger, of course, if the Beatles didn't exist. You know. Yeah. How about the other great British bands like the Stones and the Who and the Kings? Oh. Stones, of course, they were like the other end, you know what I mean? They were like kind of like the bad boys. Big Jagger was the bad boy who strutted stuff on stage. And, you know, that's something that the Beatles never really had. And I'm okay with it. They didn't have the front man with the band supporting him like the Stones. Um, to me, the Beatles consisted of four units, and it's like the four tires in a car the three tires wouldn't work. And that's what the Beatles were. All four pieces were perfect for each other. Mm. Did that impress you a lot? The fact that you had, well, overall four songwriters, even though Ringo only wrote a couple songs in the Beatle days, four okay. lead vocalists, mm -hmm. that made a big difference to you? It made a huge difference because again, you know, you had Elvis Presley who had a band, none of them sang, or they might've had a few uh, lady vocal vocalists in the background to support him in the later years. Uh, in the Stones, Mick Jagger, of course, and then you had Keith Richards, but even those two, the Jagger Richards thing, of course, it's his personal opinion. Those two voices, as far as harmonies goes, couldn't compare to the Lennon McCartney uh, duet, duo. There's no way. Those voices were just like a divine intervention. Those voices were put on this planet within a mile apart from each other and perfection. Yeah. Yeah. So um, growing up playing the guitar, I, I had imagined you were in a lot of bands. Yes, a lot of local bands. In fact, with your, our mutual friend, Jeff Togo, uh, we played together in, mm -hmm. in the early mid 70s. And that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, bands are made to join and bands are made to dissolve. That's just a fact of life, you know. And uh, every time a band would dissolve, I would get involved in another one. It's like, here I am, I'll be 70 in a month and a half. And I still perform publicly whenever I get a chance. And it's me, the guitar is me. And why is the guitar me? Because of those four guys on the Ed Sullivan show that night long ago. Mm -hmm. And all the bands that you were in were primarily cover bands or did you do any original material? Uh, we had some, uh, I had an original band uh, called uh, Billy Darren of Pumps. Uh, Billy is the female front vocalist who was great. It was a combination comedy show slash rock slash punk. Band and it was a lot of fun. And Billy, may you rest in peace. But we had a, a beautiful thing. 
Yeah, and your your guitar playing, would you say it was very influenced by George Harrison or? 110%, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I Like most musicians, musicians are thieves also, as great as some of us are, um, meaning we, what is it? Imitation's the sincerest form of flattery, whatever. Mm -hmm. Of course, so I would steal some of George's techniques, techniques, not so much his exact lines and songs, but the way he would approach a solo or the way he would approach chord structures, uh, passages from one section of a song to another. Um, I stole a lot of that from George and other musicians later on, like in the 70s uh, in, during the, the hard rock era, the Zeppelins, the Deep Purples and so on and so on. I borrowed from them, you know, and um, it made me who I am today as a musician. Mm. And when did you say you started the um, designing guitars and repairing guitars? When did that start for you? It started for me, oh, I'm gonna say probably around 1970 when I was just an 18 year old kid, I was repairing guitars for my friends and people like, I know a guy who knows a guy, Will you fix, can you fix his guitar too? But never uh, as far as commercially goes or whatever, or publicly, that didn't come until my mid twenties. And then in my late twenties, I thought, you know what? I've done everything I could possibly do to an existing guitar. Let me try building one. I bought the correct uh, lumber, quality lumber that's instrument worthy. Mm -hmm. uh, the pickups, the electronics, yada, yada. And I said, hey, let's see what happens. And like I said a few moments ago, I wound up going to the uh, Andy Summers of the police. And how that happened was sneaking backstage in 1983 during the Synchronicity Police School. <laughs> Were there any particular model guitars that you tried to emulate the most? Well, the first, the first uh, few were uh, my own designs because I didn't want to uh, emulate the guitars that were already out there doing well in the field. Um, but then I decided, well, let me tame down my designs a little bit and try to adapt to intermix my input into designs that already are out there. And that's what I did. And eventually those kind of took off, you know, and, and this is a brochure I had made up back then. Hmm. And um, now this guitar, this one in the lower corner, right over, no, oh, this is backwards, I'm sorry. Now we that can... green guitar right there, Yeah. Do you see the green guitar? That oh. is actually the green guitar George Harrison wound up getting. That is the guitar. Mm -hmm. So luckily for me, and uh, you know, according to George, lucky for George, that's one of two guitars I brought with me to London when I was invited to go over there to meet with George. Now, how did that happen in the first place? I'm excited to tell you. Okay. A friend of mine in, in Michigan, uh, his name is Rudy Maldonado. He ran a music store and I did repairs for him at his music store. And he uh, was a friend of Carl Perkins at that time. Mm -hmm. And then Rudy says, Bernie, I'm gonna be flying to London to meet with Carl uh, for the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the opening of the first Hard Rock Cafe, which is the one that's in London. Okay. It was a 20 year anniversary. And I said, oh, Rudy, okay, hey, that's cool. Good for you, wow, wow. And then he said, and by the way, there's a chance that George Harrison's gonna be there too. And I went, what, 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 what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, he said, Bernie, you wanna go along? Please. Yeah, and I'm going to grab a couple of guitars and go take them over there to London, you know, which I did. Mm -hmm. I met, and then Rudy, the person I mentioned a minute ago, he introduced me to Carl Perkins early that day. And I was just jitters over that because Carl Perkins, I mean, he's the reason, the big reason George picked up a guitar in the first place. Right. You know, and so I met with Carl and I said, Carl, I have a couple of guitars here. And this one I'd like to present to you. Now, the story will change later, but it was the green guitar that I presented to Carl, okay? And he really liked it. It felt really good to him. In fact, here's the picture of me with Carl and that green guitar. Okay. Okay? 
And um, I said to Carl, I said, so is it, you know, I got a big mouth and I stick it everywhere I can if I think it's going to help me. I said, so Mr. Perkins, is it true George Harrison might be uh, coming to this function? He says, yeah, I believe he says, yes, like he will. I go, how do you know that? And he says, well, when I, when I, how did it go? I said, oh no, first I said, I, by the way, Carl, I have another guitar. I'd love to show it to George, but that's probably very difficult. He says, no, it's not difficult at all. I said, you can get George to come here and visit me or meet with me. And he, he leaned towards me and says, son, if I told George Harrison to jump, he would say, how high, Mr. Perkins? <laughs> word for word. Because George looked at Carl like the, many of us looked at Beatles. Right. You know? So then Carl, so Carl is talking to George on a phone. A landline, of course, and I could hear George talking. You know, hi, Mr. Green. Well, the, I got this kid here named Bernie. He wants to show you a guitar. You know, can you come to town tonight? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then Carl goes, Can you be in my hotel at my hotel suite at eight o'clock tonight? I said, Absolutely. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Yes, sir. No, I, I'm busy watching Wheel of Fortune, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So anyhow, the meeting was set for eight o'clock. And mind you, this is only 11 or 12 a.m. in London. And um, so I thought I have all this time on my hands. So I, I went over to Abbey Road Studios and uh, walked in, asked the receptionist. And she, I was going to ask her, is it OK if I look at that room? Before I could finish this sentence, she said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just don't touch anything. So I went in that room. I sat there on the floor like a Indian squatting there. Before I knew it, she tapped me on the shoulder like an hour or so later, sir, you're gonna have to leave. I felt like a was uh, there. You were I'm sorry, you were freezing up there. So oh. yeah. The woman there. So anyhow, I really what happened? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I was in that room and I went crazy. You know, just loving and sucking it in, everything that happened in that room, of course. Hmm. And then went back to the hotel and then waited for that like seven o'clock to arrive because I'm, I'm always Mr. Early for anything I do. If you tell me to be at your place at eight, I'm knocking on your door at seven or seven thirty. I've always been that way. So there I am. I'm sitting in the lobby at the hotel that I was at earlier when I met Carl at, Carl, at the hotel that Carl was staying at downtown London. I'm sitting in the lobby and George Harrison and Olivia open the door and walk in the lobby. And I wanted to just bolt out of my chair. And, oh, ah, right, Mr. Harrison. But no, I maintained myself. I sat there. And then uh, George and his wife approached the elevator. They went up to the fourth floor. About 10, 15 minutes later, the receptionist at the hotel desk said, go on up to room 407, I believe it was. So I did. I opened up, uh, I knocked on the door, Carl Perkins answers, hand, shakes my hand. George Harrison uh, gets up and approaches me and shakes my hand. Hello, Mr. Hamburger, I'm George. And I'm just, look, the whole wall was a mirror, Ken, in that room. And I'm looking at my reflection, shaking George Harrison's hand. And all I could say is, I know, when he said, I'm George. <laughs> and, and I just was, so freaked out, but yet so thrilled at the same time. Wow, you are you. You are George Harrison, hmm. you know. And I, I said, hi, George, you know. And he was playing that green guitar, mm -hmm. by the way, when I opened that. And Carl let me in. That, like, anyway, so then I presented George the other guitar, which is the one in this picture here, which is like a dark reddish color. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that's in that also is in Carl Perkins room. And next thing I know, the two of them are playing my guitars. No amplifiers were in the room, but they're playing my guitars. George is sitting on that chair. Carl's sitting on his bed and they're going, hey, remember this one? Oh, hey, what about this song here? And I'm like, like this. I'm watching my hero and his hero playing my guitars doing songs like True Love and um, Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby, right. pieces of those songs. Oh, Ken, it was just amazing. 
a beautiful thing. So that was that was fun. And then, um, what was it? George says, hey, let's get in the photo. So um, Carl and George and I get in a photo. This is the photo right here. Let me get the glare out. You move it over. Yeah, OK. Got all three of you in there. All right. Yep. And when we're getting in position for the photo, George looks to his left where I'm standing. He goes, after all this time, I'm so nervous around Carl. And I looked at him and went like that. But I want to say, how do you think I feel standing <laughs> close to you? <laughs> how the heck you feel? You think, you know, so that was quite a thrill. The picture was taken. And then a few minutes later, um, George says, Bernie, can you make mandolins, electric mandolins as well? I never have. Without hesitation, I said, absolutely. What, I'm going to let somebody else make a mandolin? No. So he says, Bernie, we got to go to this function at the Hard Rock. Would you join us? I go, I'd be honored. And then we could sit down at a table and we can kind of go into detail and plan the, the mandolin. So I sat at a table at the Hard Rock with George. The funny thing is, it was a red carpet event because of the big thing that it was. Mm -hmm. So all these celebrities are walking in. Sylvester Stallone, who I also got in a photo with earlier that day. He was at the same hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, so on and so on. And, and people, you know, the flash bulbs are going, right? And then people are looking at me like, who is this guy? Because yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I was the only multi-nobody there. Everybody else was an A or a B lister, you know. So I'm sitting there at the table with, with George and, and in graphic detail, he's saying, can you do this? Can you do that? And make it like this. In fact, this is the back of my business card right here. Yeah. And that's his artwork. He drew what he wanted the head of the mantle to look like with the three tuners on one side and the two on the other. So he actually drew, that's his drawing there. And I kept that. And um, so then I went back home. Now, mind you, this took place June 18th. The coincidence about that is what's June 18th, Paul McCartney's birthday. Right. Anyway, so now I'm flying back home. And I'm thinking, God, what could top this the rest of my life, what I just lived and experienced? Mm. So then I get to work right away, get everything I need to start designing and making this electric mandolin, right? Now, months go by, George calls up and wanted to know how things were going. Everything's great. It's going to be ready. He goes, well, Bernie, let me ask you this. In October 17th, I have to be in New York for Madison Square Garden show, the trip 20." The celebration of Bob Dylan and his music. Remember that taking place, Ken? Yep. It's the third that was, anniversary. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So um, he says, I would like you and your wife to be my guests and attend that if you, you know, and meet with me at the hotel and you can deliver the mandolin at that point. I go, done. Absolutely. So we get to the hotel. I think it was the Marriott on Times Square that my wife and I stayed at. And um, I told my wife, Diane, I have to go to Brooklyn because I brought the mandolin in like a makeshift wooden box because mm -hmm. I wanted to have a, obviously a nice custom case made for it. So I went to Brooklyn where they made me the custom case, took the train over there, got back. My wife says, George called two or three times. He, he wants to see us. He can't wait to see the mandolin. So it, it's ridiculous. So then, Ken, here's what happens. So we walk well, maybe two or three blocks to the hotel George was. There had to be a crowd of 100 or 200 fans there holding Beatle records, George Harrison things, because, you know, word gets out where a Beatles stand, you know, waiting to get autographed or a picture or whatever. Hmm. All of a sudden, this guy in a baseball cap comes up to me and says, are you Bernie Hamburger? I go, yes, I am. Let's follow me. It was George's body. I guess George sent him down to, to scope me out and find me and yank me up to the room. So then... Uh, we go up the elevator, his bodyguard or representative or whatever you want to call it, me and my wife, up the elevator. We walk. He knocks on the uh, suite that George is staying in. And the door opens up. It's George. He right away gives my wife and I a big hug. How are you? How are you? So good to see you. Well, I mean, a big hug. I mean, oh, it was nice. And he even said, jokingly, you know, well, Bernie, you seem to be a little bit not as nervous this time. But that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I, go, I apologize, you know, because Ken, I've met several rock stars, made guitars from many rock stars. I don't freak out by any of them. But for me, the Beatles, they're just a different level. So, yeah, I did freak out. Most people would, you uh, know, but 
I opened up the, you know, I showed him the mandolin and he goes, wow, that's really pretty. That looks great. And he picked it up and um, let's, let's get that right here. And, and this is very okay. nice. Yeah. So that was a thrill. You know, he really enjoyed it. And, you know, he paid me, he wrote me a check for it. Um, and uh, then he says, well, I have to go to this function. Now we have to do a sound check at Madison Square Garden. I said, okay, fine. Uh, and then Diane and I, we go back to the hotel. But, but listen, I have to back up a little bit. That event at the Hard Rock in London. Mm -hmm. Okay, George had to go do an interview with somebody. Carl Perkins comes and takes his place. And he says, Bernie, I got some bad news about the guitar situation. And I'm thinking, oh no, you or George didn't really like the guitar. What he said was, remember you presented George with the red one and me the green one? Well, George wants both of them. Would it be okay if I gave that green guitar to George? He really wants it and likes it. I said, Mr. Perkins, absolutely. I'll make you another one. I will. Tell me what color or what how you make a blue son, just like my blue suede shoes. I said, yes, sir. So I had to give you that information. This is because that's how George wound up with that green guitar. Okay, now back to New York. Okay, so that evening we go to the uh, Madison Square Garden. You know, we had good tickets in the VIP section. In fact, we sat right around Rabbi Shankar's family members. We were seated with them. That was a thrill. So there we are, and we're watching that beautiful concert, you know, and then when George comes out, he does the two songs, Absolutely Sweet Marie and If Not For You. And when he's done, you know, he's looking straight out into the audience. Thank you, thank you. And then he looks over where Di my wife Diane and I are sitting, and he goes like this. And you can see that if you watch footage of the concert, he's waving that way. And that was nice. Concert ends. Diane and I, we go back to the hotel. It's like one in the morning or midnight, something like that. We go to bed. We go to sleep. The 2.30, the, the hotel phone rings. And right away, we were worried, like, God, maybe because whoever was babysitting our kids, something happened or whatever, you know, because who's going to call me at 2.30 in the morning? Bernie. It's, no, my wife answers. She goes, hello. Oh, hi, George. George Harrison calls. True, I swear to you. He calls and how are you? How are you, Diane? Blah blah blah. Can I speak to Bernie? Yeah. Hi, George. How's it going? Thank you so much for the tickets. We loved every minute of the show. It was wonderful and it was fun meeting you today. And he wanted to know, did you enjoy it? Were you, were you happy? Were, are you glad you came to the show? What am I going to say? No. <laughs> yes. Thank you. It was an honor. I mean, it was so fun visiting with you today. And, and then he goes on a tangent talking about various subjects and car racing and different foods that he likes and different instruments and everything. It had to be a good half hour conversation. It was the greatest thing. And, you know, and when he say goodbye, I love you. He said, I love you to you? Yes. Oh, wow. I'm kidding. <laughs> it was a thrill. Yeah. That's something. Well, I've got a few questions to ask you based on everything. I didn't want to interrupt you at all. Okay, and if, yeah, if I left anything out, ask away. Oh yeah, those two guitars that you brought, why did you pick those two? Random. I had, as I showed you the opening of that brochure, I had about a dozen or so guitars. Why did I pick those two? Well, some of the guitars look like 80s guitars, where back in the 80s, pointy guitars were kind of in vogue. Uh-huh. You know, the, the heavy metal looking guitars or whatever you want to call it. And I thought, you know what? This is George Harrison and Carl Perkins. Let me grab something that's more traditional, you know, looking and uh, not so like wild and crazy. And that's what maybe uh, can pick those two particular guitars. Okay. Was there anything that you did in particular to the, to the way it was designed or I mean, not designed, but to the sound of it that you thought might be more suitable for what George would want? Great question. And yes. That's the other thing. The, the electronics that were on the two guitars I brought are more suitable to getting the sounds that George and or Carl would be more welcoming to, you know, welcome to as far as the sound that those guitars would deliver. They wouldn't be harsh or over the top or over powerful. Like, you know, let's say I was meeting Deep Purple or Led Zeppelin. Obviously, I would have brought something a little different that was going to have more kick. You know what I mean? So, yeah, to answer, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. 
did George specifically say to you, I really love the sound of the green guitar for this reason or that reason? Or... Absolutely. Here's what happened. Okay. After we say goodbye to George in New York during the mandolin delivery and the Dylan thing, um, a few months went by. And then the three Beatles went into the studio to do the uh, anthology um, new songs, Free as a Bird and Real Love. And Jeff Lynn produced, of course. Well, Jeff, George Harrison called me out of the blue from the actual studio at the time when they were laying down the tracks for these songs. Hmm. Ernie, I have to tell you, Jeff Lynn told me to, to give you a call because he wanted me to tell you that he can't remember the last time he had a guitar that recorded and tracked as well as these, this guitar and the tone it delivered on the recordings Jeff Lynn said he, he barely had to do any tweaking on the mixing console. He, he says those, he told me, George, wherever you got that guitar, don't let that guitar go. And wow. I could even hear Ringo and, uh, and somebody else like conversing like in the background because it was a busy room. It was a recording right. studio, you uh -huh. know? And I, and I just lost it when he told me that. So it was amazing. You... Did Jeff Lynn call you up and ask for some guitars for himself? Or? No, I, I would have liked that, but no, Jeff Lynn and I uh, did not speak during that conversation. It was just George and I that spoke during that telephone conversation. It only lasted maybe five minutes. And That's just because cool. they wanted me to know, or George wanted me to know that Carl, uh, that um, Jeff Lynn was very pleased with what George was playing and what he was doing with it. Yeah. So when you watch, the real love video you will see that green guitar and that's the one where george does the solo in the middle that is it. there's another guitar that he plays at the beginning that has more of a black body yes sir that's a fender stratocaster all right so he used more than one guitar on the on the song that is correct he used those two guitars uh, when you hear the slide sections those are that's the black stratocaster all the other guitar Electric guitar on Real Love, that's my guitar. That's the green guitar for the licks in between vocal lines and, of course, the entire guitar. So, and some of the outro lines during as the song is starting to tail away. Okay. It wasn't used on Free as a Bird at all? The green no. Guitar? Well, you know what? I don't know for sure. I don't know if it was for sure or not. But it could be. I wish George was around so I could ask him that question. You know, maybe... If I get to talk to Danny, his son again, maybe he might have the answer to that. Or Jeff Lynn, if I get to talk to Jeff Lynn, that would be, he would obviously remember. Yeah. Well, actually George got to keep the red guitar too. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you wouldn't know if he used that for anything. So. That is a fact. And he also wound up with another guitar, a nine string that I had also made for George Harrison. A nine string is very similar to a 12 string uh, do you play guitar, Ken? Uh, basic. Okay. Well, you know what a 12 string does. Yes. Right? It has, you know, four of the strings have octaves of the other strings, and then the other two strings are uh, tuned in unison. Well, what I did was I made the three high strings singular and left the, the bottom three strings with their paired octave string. So when you play a chord, it virtually still sounds like a 12 string. But for the three singular strings, you could do the bends and stuff so you can play solos. A typical 12 string, you can't do the bends without them bending in unison to, the, to pitch. Okay. So that, that was a cool idea, he, he thought, and he wound up getting that guitar. I don't know if he ever laid a track with it or not, but it did stay in his archive in his collection. And then um, the other thing, um, he asked me to make another guitar. Well, I guess I'm jumping ahead. Were you gonna ask me something else, Ken? Uh, well, I, I... You sort of answered the question, but for something like the Brainwashed album, we have no idea if you use your guitars and even that mandolin. I looked at right. the there's no mandolin listed for the album. Exactly. I scanned the album cover, of course. Oh, darn it, darn it. I just couldn't, you know, see any indication or or affirmation that he used any of my gear on that brainwashed album, which was his last album. Right. So if I ever get the chance to talk to Danny or Jeff Lynn, I don't know if Jeff Lynn produced that or his son and him, I'm not sure. Who produced it with Danny? Oh, okay. I would ask either of those guys, hey, I'm just curious, 
than any of my guitars or that electric mandolin wind up on any other tracks. Maybe someday I'll have that opportunity to do that, you know, poise that question. That's amazing. I wish you could have designed a ukulele for him. <laughs> you would, no you kidding, have right? Maybe in brainwashed to be. To have yeah, one. absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then uh, later, the tail end of 1999, uh, I got a call from him. Can you make me a guitar similar to the another guitar similar to the green one, but do it in like a sunburst finish? And I'm going to make it for a good friend. His initials are P.A. And if you can put his name, not his name, but his initials on the head. I said, George, I'd be honored to do that. Thank you very much. I, you know, being a polite mensch, I didn't want to ask him, well, who's P.A.? Because that's really none of my concern. You know, if he wanted me to know, he would have told me that. So I went ahead, built the guitar. And then um, I had, it. I guess, a courier came to pick it up. I didn't get to see George again or meet with him. He had a courier come and pick it up from me. And then it wound up going to PA. I'm going to find out about 10 years ago who PA, PA stood for. Um, a guitar shop here in town that sells guitar publications. The one guy calls me, says, Bernie, there's a picture of your guitar and you're mentioned in this magazine. I go, really? I said, I'm hanging up now. I'm going to run down there and grab a stack of those magazines which I did, and I found out who P.A. is. It's this guy. His name is, let me get it in a shot. His name is Paul Allen. Paul Allen and Bill Gates founded Microsoft. So obviously, he is one of the cabillionaires that founded Microsoft, right? And he, Paul happened to be an avid, you know, an avid guitar lover and collector. He has, uh, he, well, he's deceased now. But he had Jimi Hendrix guitar that was played at Woodstock, Eric Clapton's Brownie guitar, you know, Uber collection, right? Mm -hmm. And then I opened up the magazine and I saw this photo right there, okay? And this guitar right here, I mean, let's see here. I know it's the other. That yeah. guitar right there. That's the guitar George had me make for him, which is shaped and looks just like the green one, but it's a tobacco finish. And in the caption, it says, uh, uh, next to Air Clapton's Brownie is, a, is Bernie Hamburger's custom made for George Harrison guitar. Because George had me make it for him. Yeah. And then, and then uh, you know, there's another sentence here where it's, uh, this is, uh, What's his name? Paul Allen says, George Harrison made a noteworthy impression with me on a custom guitar by Luthier Bernie Hamburger, one of the former Beatles' favorite builders. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, I about died. <laughs> that should be you on know. your website, that quote. <laughs> I'm sorry? That should be on your website, that quote. I know, it should be. All I have to do is figure out how to manipulate my website. I'm very... Uh, technologically illiterate, but maybe someday I'll figure out a way to get that up there. I think I did put that on my Facebook at one time. So that was the last time you spoke to George was that phone call? Yes, sir. Sad but true. Mm. Um, I did get a call many years later from a guy by the name of Alan Rogan. May he rest in peace as well. Alan Rogan used to be George Harrison's guitar technician. And when George used to go on tour, he would travel with him and do his guitar stuff for him. And he also worked for uh, Pete Townsend. Okay. Uh, Alan Rogan. So anyhow, Alan Rogan called my house one day. And of course, this is when I had a landline. And my wife said, you had another call from a customer or somebody. I said, who? No, his name is Alan Rogan. I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I missed that call. But he did wind up uh, calling back and he said, Bernie, there's something I need to tell you. I go, what is it, Alan? Well, as we all know, George had many, many guitars, almost all of them which are in storage. But the last few years of his life, the only guitars within his reach were the ones that he built for him. They were always on a stand, plugged into the amplifiers, ready for him to reach at his convenience at any time. And I about melted when he told me that. That oh. is the ultimate compliment right there. Oh what else? Exactly. I mean, my God, you know, 
And, um, you know, and um, that night, when going back to the hotel in Manhattan, when I presented the mandolin, he, he said, Bernie, you do such great work. How did you get into this? You know, I said, well, George, I thought I came full circle. What do you mean? He goes, well, I saw you and that band on the Ed Sullivan show that night. <laughs> and it made me want to become you, a guitar player like you, mm -hmm. you know, and um, eventually I got into fixing him and building him. And here we are. So, George, I'm blaming you for all this. <laughs> and he kind of smirked and smiled and uh and more than once or twice, he told me, he says, Bernie, I'm just like you. I'm a lead guitar player, but I was with the right fellows at the right time. Very humble. Mm. No, I want to say, no, you're not just a lead guitar player. You're George freaking Harrison of the greatest rock and roll band of all time. Mm. Most famous lead guitar player of all time. So that was nice. Anyhow, going back a minute ago, that was nice when Alan Rogan called me to tell me that those are the only guitars he played. And then Alan Rogan said to me, but Bertie, I am in a bit of a pickle with you. I go, what's wrong, Alan? He goes, well, as you know, I was always on tour with George. And George was going to go on tour again, Ken. He was, gonna, he was playing a final world tour. And he says, but Bernie, this time your name was on the itinerary, not mine. You were going to be his traveling assistant on the tour. Oh, my God. Because George had asked me once, uh, have you ever done guitar tech work? And I go, yeah, I have. I did some stuff for White Snake and a lot of other artists and stuff. He goes, oh, good to know. So he wanted me to travel with him on his final tour, Ken. No BS, honest to God. And we know the rest of the story. Sadly, the tour never happened. And George, that's when George started not feeling well anymore. So when, when Alan Rogan told you this, when was this time-wise? This was in um, early 2000. And 2001, of course, is when we lost George in November. Yeah, because the dates were set. The country, the cities and the countries were all scheduled, uh, not publicly scheduled, but the itinerary and the contracts are already drawn up. That's amazing. Uh, you know, I've never heard this before. My viewers have never heard this before, I'm sure. This is, I, just, this is, I just did an interview with John Harris. Uh-huh did mixing for the live live in japan album uh -huh. uh -huh. and he was there for all the concerts and i asked him because it was always my impression that george was going to use this tour just to get his feet wet to get back into per performing and then yes. you know tour the u.s do some kind of a world tour and he told me there were there were never any plans for that but that was then that's 1990 that was then. this was in 2000 maybe no, it wasn't in 2000. It was after the passing. It was an O2 because it, the, that's the way the conversation was. George was going to do the tour and George was going to put you on the itinerary as his traveling assistant with the guitars. So yeah, it had to happen after the passing of George, the conversation with Alan. Yeah. But because yeah, so the beginning of the conversation was Bernie George isn't here to tell you, but he only plays your guitars. Everything else is put in storage. Okay. So there you go. But he meant to, when he said this, he meant for the year 2000? No, no. I, I, I misspoke when I told you the call happened. No, the tour was going to happen in, you know, early 01 or mid 01. That was when the tour, but that's already George is starting to not feel good anymore. Right. And as we, we lost George the end of November of 01. So it was going to happen like previously that summer. I and nobody else, even you, didn't know that there was going to be a George Harrison tour. But it never left their office, the itinerary, the, the scheduling, the cities that uh, right. to be played. You know, it wasn't announced yet. And good thing it wasn't. Bernie, I'm in shock. <laughs> yeah. Just like I was then. I've never heard this, and I'm sure almost everyone watching this has never heard this. Before. It's very, very possible, Ken. Uh, yeah, so, you know, that's my luck. <laughs> I didn't get to travel with George, but that's okay. Okay, I know that you told me privately and you can tell everybody that, um, well, first of all, you live in Las Vegas. <laughs> and that is correct. You've seen The Love Show many times now. Several right? times, yes, in the teens, yes, sir. And uh, there was one time, it was for the fifth anniversary, I think you told me, where 
you saw Olivia yes. and Danny there, and yep. Danny Olivia. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Danny Harrison. Uh, you know, Danny and I, we embraced, we hugged, and he told his girlfriend or lady friend at the time who was with him, "This is Bernie Hamburger. He made guitars for me, Dad. You know, he made some nice guitars, and you know, and hi, Danny, how you doing? The hug, the embrace, and then they walk." Because security was pushing these guys to where they needed to be, the entourage, you know, because these casinos are crowded with a lot of people, you know. So for security's sake, I, we didn't get to stand and talk and all that stuff. Okay. Let's move on <laughs> just a little bit here because I know that sure. you also met Paul. How did that happen? I met Paul actually um, the year before I met George in Cleveland, uh, Cleveland, Ohio at the Municipal Stadium, the baseball stadium in the Flowers and the Dirt Tour. Okay. And uh, that's when I, uh, that picture of me and Paul, that was 91, I was 39, that would make Paul 49. So we were both quite a bit younger. And uh, how did that come about? Okay, my wife who worked for an airline back then, um, she had a friend that worked for the same airline, a lady that happened to be a flight attendant who happened to be the girlfriend of, at that time, Paul McCartney's good traveling guitar technician. <laughs> so, you know, my wife found out about that and she says, you know, and the lady told my wife, Diane, you know, I can make arrangements for you and your husband, Bernie, to meet Paul, Her Paul Harrison, <laughs> Paul McCartney, if you like. And so, of course, so, uh, it was set up for Cleveland. It was like a three hour drive from uh, where we lived in Michigan, went to Cleveland. And I, uh, I met with that guitar technician and uh, he let my wife and I in backstage and we stood there waiting for uh, Paul and Linda and everybody to show up, which was maybe half hour later. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, my knees are like, like this, I'm buckling, I'm freaking out. Cause mind you, I had never met a Beatle yet at this point. And wow, so, you know, all of a sudden, wow, here comes Paul walking up the steps with these two gigantic guys, I guess, obviously bodyguards. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at me like, who are you? You know, get out of here, whatever. But the guitar technician said, no, they're cool. They're cool. He's going to show Paul a guitar. Woo! You know, so we got to stay. And Diane and I were watching the sound check. And Paul's playing the piano like, you know how Paul, and he's looking right at me and my wife, and I'm like, oh my God, this is killing me. <laughs> this is Paul McCartney, you know, and this is great. And Linda was there, and Linda, what a sweetheart of a lady. She's talking to my wife and everything. Just a nice down-to-earth lady. It's so sad that Linda's gone because she was a beautiful person. That's certainly what I've heard from everybody. Yes, yes. I'm in touch with Linda, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So that was my... First uh, encounter with a Beatle. Did you have any conversations with him or you just watched them most of the time perform? Uh, after, you know, the sound, that's when the picture was taken when he was done sound checking. And after that, of course, he was scooted away. Hmm. And, um, you know, and then of course we had, we were given tickets to the show and that was the end of any encounter or meeting at that point, you know. But then a few times from then till now, Paul and I made our eye contact at the Mirage and, you know, I shook his hand at the Mirage and I said, Paul, thank you for all the wonderful music. He grabbed both my, my hand with his both hands and he goes, you're welcome, you're welcome. It was a thrill to write all these songs. You know, I'm glad you liked them. I go, absolutely. You know, and that was while we were walking to the love show, you know, and that was really cool. Didn't get to sit with him or anything, but we were in proximity where I could, you know, have you seen a love show, Ken? Oh, yeah. I've seen okay. it twice. Okay, yeah. So, you know, I've seen it several times. So, But that night, I'm not watching the show. I'm watching Paul and Ringo and everybody watch the show, you mm -hmm. know, because that's surreal. Those guys is what the show's about. And they're into it, and they're watching it. And, and some of the songs, you can see Paul go like this in his chair and everything. And you can see him mouthing along with the lyrics of his songs. I go, this is weird ridiculous you know and so that you know and then again you know a week ago uh thursday that Tim paul and i uh connected visually when the limos pulled in you know you could see that on my facebook page and stuff 
-hmm. and looked at me and went, you know, he made that face like, <laughs> you know, so that was a thrill. And um, I'm going to attempt that again next week, Friday. Um, a friend of mine and I were going to drive to L.A. and play, try to play that game all over again. Uh -huh. Well, anytime that my wife and I go to Las Vegas, we're going to try and see love no matter what. But uh, I know that they yeah. possibly make changes to the show. So that makes it yes. even more interesting. Not that I would remember everything <laughs> from when I of first saw it. Of but, course. But the only thing about love um, that kind of bothered me is that I was, you know, the, the sound is all around you. All the different elements and Beatles recordings and you're so drawn into the audio that you may not be paying attention to what's on stage. You hit the nail right on the head because that's my experience every time I see that show. I mean, I'm not taking away the talent of the Cirque people because they are just, I, I wouldn't know how to climb up a rope or do any of that crazy stuff. I wouldn't have the nerve uh -huh. or the physical attributes, but it's a great performance visually, but because who you and I are, as big Beatle fans as you and I are, we watch the show with our ears more than our eyes because that sound, like you said, I mean, it's great, the music's great. And the way they push those sound, the, the sounds of those songs in that round theater, it's just amazing, you know, it mm. really is. Okay. Um, and you've met Ringo. Did you meet Ringo at, at the Mirage? Did you get to talk to him there or, or what? Uh, he's walking by and, you know, he had, he, Bodyguards wouldn't let us get real close to Ringo or Yoko or uh, Paul or Olivia or any of them. So, you know, you know, Ringo, what does he always say? Peace and love, peace and love. So, you know, hey, Ringo, peace and love, peace and love. He goes, peace and love, brother, peace and love, you know. But uh, I had an encounter with Ringo. Um, I wish it would have wound up to be a better encounter. But, you know, I had an 8x10 black and white glossy, the picture that's on the Meet the Beatles album cover. Hmm. And when I met Paul, I had him sign it. And he was nice enough to do that. And as well as George, when I brought that picture to London. And then when I met Ringo, I said, hi, Ringo, I'm Bernie Hamburger. I'm a guitar maker. I make guitars for George that were on the uh, anthology sessions. And he goes, oh, nice, nice, oh, nice, you know. And then I go, uh, as you can see, I have a photo here. Those two guys were so nice enough to sign it for me. Could you please sign it for me? He goes, no, no, we're not going to have any of that. I'm a little bit too tired right now. No, no, no. I go, oh, well, okay, thanks. You know, so that, yeah, that was kind of a, a sad moment at that moment in time. But what are you going to do? That's a so, shame. Yeah, it's a shame. But you know what? He's still a Beatle. He is who he is. And, you know, even Paul now, he doesn't do the autograph thing or the picture posing, I guess, from what I gather. You know, maybe because of security reasons or like, you know, you might have mentioned it to me one time and that afraid that they're going to sell these things and make a bunch capitalize on their autographs. And I, that's with Ringo. I think part of the reason why Ringo said he's not signing autographs anymore is because he was upset about knowing that whether it was as late as CD or whatever, it would be up on eBay the next day. Yeah. yeah. The person that you're doing this for doesn't really care that you gave him your signature. So I think that... I think that, and you know what, I get it. Yeah, you know, and and that in that regard, I don't blame Paul and Ringo for being that way because you asked me for my autograph, Ken, and now you're going to sell it, and make a buck on me. I get it, so I respect that. Well, most of his career, Paul has always been accommodating to the fans. Yes, more so than than the other. Yeah, yeah. And that's nice, you know. Mm. And um, you know, my career of making guitars, uh, especially for George. I'm not gonna lie, that really helped my business to a certain level. I have built several guitars just like it by people who are Beatle guitar collectors who love George Harrison and his gear. In fact, <laughs> I always have another one in a lurch in case I get the call, here it is. Okay. You know, so this is exactly, exactly spec for spec, just like that first green one I made that George wound up with. Well, I'll have a link to your website in case anybody wants to buy that. <laughs> that is fine, you know, and also um, I'm on Facebook, Bernie Hamburger, Hamburg Guitar. Mm -hmm. I'm open to the world and I have an email address, hamburgguitar at gmail.com. When you met Paul at the Mirage and he shook your hand and everything, 
was he aware of what you had done that you had given George these guitars and in fact that the green guitar was used in real love? Do you think he even knew that? I don't know if he acknowledged, if he connected my face with that or not. Because hmm. mind you, th th those sessions took place in 1996. And George sees, I mean, Paul sees zillions of people constantly, right. all the time. So at that time, I was probably another face that shook his hand, you know, uh, and I didn't have time to, I wanted so badly to kind of get in a conversation with Paul regarding that subject, but, you know, move, get, we got to go, we got to go, you know, that kind of thing with, with their security and everything. So, man, darn it, dang it, <laughs> it didn't happen. All right, one last thing, uh, since we just mentioned Paul, I know you just saw him in concert. The first concert yes. got back tour in Spokane. Yes. What did you think? As always, every time I saw Paul, he knocks me out. You know, I mean, I always put it this way. I'm in the same room breathing the same oxygen as this great legend. Mm. And I just was absorbed. And it was like, wow. I had good seats. I was in like a... I think row 11 or 12 center main floor. So it was just like breathtaking and it was wonderful. And again, you know, the man had so much stamina for his age and sang really well um, up on his feet three hours, you mm -hmm. know, and just killed, just killed. You know, I mean, he sang some of the songs a little differently, you know, probably because he's 80, he's not at Sullivan in his twenties, Paul anymore. We all know that, and that's fine. But he still deserves so much praise. I mean, his performance was just amazing. You know, between him and Ringo, it's it's we're so blessed. You know, yes, we are. Only that they're here, but they're still giving so much to us. You right. Know? They didn't say we're done twenty years ago. You're not going to see us again. No, they did the opposite. They're mm. still very much out there. They're still relevant, and whether you're eight or 80, you're gonna be in that audience. How many artists captivate those many generations? I know, you know what I mean? That, that's the beauty of it, you know? Oh, what can you say? You know, and, and, and my aff affiliation with George fortunately led me to other nice customers such as Tom Petty and Mike Campbell. Right. Uh, I got to make guitars for them because uh, they were big George nuts. So they said, would you make us guitars too? I go, absolutely, sure. Incredible. Yeah. I, the life you've had. I, I, I lived a great life and I hope to keep living a great life. And I'm, every once in a while I say, Bert, you know, Bernie, you're one of the luckiest so-and-sos around because <laughs> of what I got to do in my, in my career. Hey, if all I ever did was give George a guitar that he used on you know, on a Beatles record or a solo record, I, I could yeah. stop right there. <laughs> I know, you know, on that subject, you know, I'm flying home from London. And then of course I didn't want it to happen, but I thought, you know, if this plane crashed right now, nothing's gonna top this the rest of my life anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? As a matter of expression. Yeah. But you know, like, God, I did everything I wanted to do with my guitar building career from start to finish making guitars for the reason I even play guitar, making it for that guy, George. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, but fortunately, uh, time went on and it's still going on. And, you know, we still thank God for, you know, YouTube and other media platforms. You can watch the Beatles anytime you want still. You can watch George, anybody, Elvis, you name it. It's endless. We can do it all now thanks to things like YouTube. And, so they're all still here. Yeah, well, you've got, between the Beatles and their solo music, you have over 100 albums to go through. And that's, you know, several lifetimes worth of great music. So yes. boring. there's always something you're in the mood to, to listen to or watch. And right. uh, is, a, is quite a phenomenon to me. Because you can get Isn't food it? all day long <laughs> just watching. Yeah. Music. And they say still to this date, the most successful selling solo Beatles album is George's All Things Must Pass. Okay, well, deserves that's, that's another did you know, you know, and I think that's pretty cool, you know, yeah. that that had happened. And uh, even though at one time when the Beatles were the Beatles, 
George was lucky that John or Paul would let him have a song in each album, you know, because they, they kind of treated him with love, of course, but like the little brother, you know, we're John and Paul. Okay, yeah, okay, we'll put that on there too or whatever on the album. But every George song and every album was a smash. Hey, you know? I love Don't Bother Me, going back to the beginning, you know, it's even the yeah. first song, first, first full song. First full song, Don't Bother Me, it was great, great. You know, I love that song. And it's the first song on side two on Meet the Beatles. Right. You know, and uh, the two biggest selling, most successful songs on Abbey Road are Something and Here Comes the Sun, mm. George Harrison. Well, you know, I always say we had four supreme talents. And, yes. And three yes. Of the greatest songwriters of all time. So we, yeah. you know, and Ringo has developed into a very good songwriter as well. So, sure. uh, yeah, there's so much talent contained in that band. And then, you know, for many reasons, they had to break up. And then they yeah. gave us, you know, what is it now? Uh, 50 plus years of solo music. And it's still continuing with more great stuff. That Paul Actually, it's scaringly, it's almost 60 years. Did I get the, since, no, it's 1970, oh. if you say 1970, so it's 50. Oh, oh, I thought you meant since the Beatles started. Yeah, so yeah. it's 60 altogether, yeah. Yeah, 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 you're right, Ken. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, it, and when you put it that way, it's like, wow, it's a half a century, you know? Yeah. Pretty good, pretty good. No other band will, and here's the other thing. Long after all of us are gone, the Beatles will still be listened to. Not too many artists will be. Maybe Elvis and maybe the Beatles. And, you could probably count on one hand who's going to listen, what music will be played in one, two, three hundred years from now, you know, well, from this era. That's a sad thing in a way, because I think, you know, whatever music I've listened to in the past that I've loved, I still love. Mm -hmm. So oh, me too. I, I would hate to think only a small percentage of all that music will still get played in the future. But I um, do, too. You never know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No one knows. really. I I mean, I'm a big Iron Maiden fan, a Rush fan, Zeppelin. I can go on and on with who I really adore and just love so much, mm. you know, but they're not the Beatles. They're just different. They're great, but they're different. The Beatles are in a class and a world all to themselves. So, so well said. Absolutely, Ken. You hit the nail on the head. Okay, so I'm going to include, if uh, you folks want to look in the description box, the link to Bernie's business. Hamburg guitars and um, anything else you want me to include there uh, so people might want to get in touch with you? Yes, uh, it's Hamburg guitar at uh, dot com, H A M B U R G U I T A R dot com, or I'm on Facebook. Just search Facebook Bernie Hamburger, Hamburg guitar, the Bernie Ham. Obviously, with my name, there's not a whole lot of Bernie hamburgers on the planet, I would imagine. It's I don't a very know any other hamburger. Yeah, I know. The only it's, hamburger in my life, Bernie. That's it. And, and the ones you eat at the restaurant. Those right. are the other hamburgers. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's how you get a hold of me. And uh, my email, hamburgguitar at gmail.com. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Bernie, for sharing your story with us. I thank you. It was fun doing this with you, Ken. It really was. I've got a lot of viewers who are saying, you know, these people that you interview, I wish I had their life. <laughs> well, I'm sure their lives are great, too. And uh, I was going to mention, Ken, should you ever come back to Vegas? Give me a call. Have oh. you come by? I'll show you some more stuff. Oh, I'd love to see all your, your guitars and all of your equipment. And we'll go watch. That would be great. <laughs> okay, thank you. Be awesome. Bernie. Yeah. Thanks to all thank of you for watching. Thank you. Be well. Okay. We'll Bye. see you all very soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.